day to learn with Native Americans in this country. Um, I am Lynn McAleer, and it is my great honor to introduce Laurie Liwa Thomas. So she is an enrolled citizen of the Hopland Band of Pomo Indians and a descendant of the Miwok and Huichim tribal groups of Lake Sonoma, Mendocino, and Marin counties. Please turn your phones off. <laughs> um, so Professor Lywa Thomas was hired by Santa Rosa Junior College as the Native American Studies instructor in a tenured tract. Uh, she is the first. <laughs> She's the first Native American studies instructor to be hired at that junior, junior college in its 103 year history. About time. Lori is enrolled in a doctoral program for Native American studies at UC Davis, where she is doing her research that's focused on Native Americans in North America and in California in particular. Please welcome Lori Lyle Thomas. Hello. Chamai. I have to remember not to breathe loud. Sounds like the dinosaurs are coming. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start. Hidi imo mayama kauke. Yowala make chache lada. Joke chache lada. Shoke chache lada. Boke chache lada. Shoke chache lara Yakama el baya ya urao taru Yakama el baya ya natam Ya better boch Yakama el yalske yoma ura Yakwi He she He English she E Lori Lewa Thomas He hintel she E Gatitas, Kakamuts, Kayuke Kamu, A Shokawake, A Padaha Ke, A Latte Ke, A Danaka Ke, A Nakosha Ke, A Baloka Ke, A Lima Peru Ke, a tamales bake and more. <laughs> so greetings, I said to you in my central Pomo language, the language that my father speaks or the language he spoke. Um, I told you that greetings, everybody, all you various people who've traveled here from different places, various people from the east, from the south, from the west, and from the north. Our father loves us very much. It is he who is guiding us with his hands. And that's why we're still here, because he cares very deeply for us. My Indian name is Gatitas, and it means dick bird or wren. My other Indian name is Gakamuts, and that means morning star in Kashaya Pomo language. My other name, we have lots of names. <laughs> My other name is from Point Arena, where I was raised on my father's res is also morning star, but it's Kayuke Kamu. So it's different from Kashaya language, Kakamuts. Same, same, um, 
same thing, the morning star. My English name is Lori Lewa Thomas. And the only people with the last name Lewa are my family in this country. It's an indigenous name. My grandfather was one of the, his parents were uh, Indians from Homo, Kishire region. His father was one of the LU Aleutian sailors that came in with the Russians. And they landed right there at Fort Ross in Matini. That's where some of my people come from. I even come from Charles Hopp from Hopp Ranch, the German man who married Molly Jarvis. That was my great, great, great grandparents. Um, I'm from here locally. I was raised and um, I was actually born in San Francisco during termination and relocation era. My parents, I'm just one big giant federal policy. That's why I love teaching in a class. I'm like, woo. Um, anyways, but that's where I'm from. Those are my people. I have a whole bunch of people. I'm from Yorkville. I'm from Potter Valley. I'm from Stewart's Point, Point Arena. I'm hoplin through my mother. That's where I'm an enrolled member of my tribal nation. Um, I have a grandma from Lima, Peru. I have grandparents who are Spanish, who are Italian, who are English, who are German, uh, Irish, um, the Knight family were the McKnights, but they changed it to Knights, <laughs> uh, from Hopland and um, Yokeo. I have relatives from Lake County. Um, I'm Hucknum, which is an offshoot of the Yuki people who are the original people of Round Valley and Kobolo. But if you ask me, where am I from? I'll always say Point Arena because that's what the place I know the most. I don't know nothing compared to what my dad knew or what my grandpa knew. What I know is nothing compared to what they know. <laughs> um, but um, so I just got hired by Santa Rosa Junior College and I currently teach at Mendocino College for three years now. I'm still hanging on for one more summer session and then I'll be completely turned over, over to here. So I'm still affiliated because those are all my relatives of, up there. I still help them. I just spoke in Lake County yesterday, but I'm really excited to be in a position to have my dream job. The day I found out that I was selected, I was actually teaching at the Coast Center in Fort Bragg and I was down at the parking lot um, at Pomo Bluffs eating my lunch. And I got a call from the vice president of the college. And I jumped out of my car and I started dancing all around and people started hugging me, strangers. They were like, can I hug you? And I go, yeah. Anyways, I was like, I just got my dream job. I get to design a Native American studies program. <laughs> I'm 40 years deep into this. I've been going to school since I left Point Arena High School and got right into Davis. And I'm still going because I haven't filed. But it's half written. I just keep getting sidetracked. But <laughs> I'll finish. <laughs> but yeah. So that's where I'm from. That's what I'm doing. I currently teach. Um, I have a Native American studies already. We have an associate degree program. I'm designing certificate programs. I wanna complete some online programs. I wanna create programs that are um, really interesting. Like I'm, uh, I have new classes that are coming up because one of my expertise is, is native language but I wanna teach an indigenous and minority language class that anybody who wants to learn whatever language, whether it be a homeland language, whether it be Filipino, whether, I don't even know the official name, it starts with a T. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, I've had people from Mexico want to learn Puerto Pecha and other things, but if you get your own materials, I'm gonna model the class just like UC Davis. I was the first person to petition to use Homo language as a foreign language, right? Foreign language, native language. <laughs> well, it worked. Um, so I used Central Pomo. I had a linguist test me. 
and I was able to uh, use that. And then in the PhD program at Davis, you have to choose two native languages. So I chose my father's language because that's what I know the most. I dream in the Kashaya language, but I can speak Central Pomo, which is north of here. Kashaya is part of Sonoma County. It's on the northern tip, right on the, in the ocean, Danica Mountain by the sea. That's where my daddy was born. But he raised us in San Francisco till we were five years old when him and mom met each other right down here, 4th Street. <laughs> Back in the day, that's where I remember everyone was. Um, and so my life has been great. Growing up in Point Arena is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. So I came here and I want to share with you some of my work. Now I could tell stories. I could stay here for weeks. Those are some of the most, to me, that's my teaching pedagogy. That's my style. Is I have a story for everything. I mean, because I was groomed as a little kid. They could see how, they could see when you have a smart person. I sparkle, talkative. That's why I was called Gatitas. I asked the man who named me that. I go, why did you name me that? He goes, you know, those little brown little birds that run around, jump, 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 talk a lot. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> that's that's why he named me that. Because I like to talk a lot. But old people groom um, young people when they can see if they're smart. And so they chose me um, to do this. And I also have a photographic memory like my mother. It's sort of waning. <laughs> Used to be really strong, but it's slipping. <laughs> yeah, I'm an emerging elder. <laughs> Somebody asked me if I was going to bless an event recently, and I was like, I don't consider myself an elder yet. Um, I'm almost there. <laughs> but... We lost most of our elders during COVID. We lost nine. That's that's big for little tiny tribes. Five at daddy's, four at mom's. We lost our language speaker at Hopland. That was devastating. So now it's like me and my brother are next in line. It feels kind of weird to be the next ones that are, people are going to be coming to. So anyways... My dissertation is on stories, stories that connect people to places. And I'm obsessed with stories because everywhere I've ever traveled and living in Point Arena means you ride in a car a lot. Oh my God, Mountain View, Fort Bray, Santa Rosa. My parents both worked and so we were dragged all around. And we were dragged at meetings at the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Indian Health Service, all the educational board meetings. My parents were very community involved. And all they did was talk about making life better for other people. And those are the conversations that I have. And now I'm having them with my kids. They have no choice either. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to tell you some stories. And that beautiful photo, Vito Palacino gave me permission to use his photo for all future PowerPoints. He's a, I think it's America... I can find the website if you really want to purchase it. It's beautiful. It's one of the best drone, drone shots. The reservation that I grew up on actually is three miles up that Garcia River. And up there on those ridges, that's Nicosia. That's my old village, my old people's village where the old roundhouse, the old graveyard, the cemetery. And then, um, and then the roundhouse is like three miles up this. So we can hear the surf from our house. We grew up listening to that. And uh, so this is the ancient a village of Malala. Ma means earth or land and Lala or Lali means place. So my people were right here and they believe that they come right here and emerge right out of this land. And we don't care whether people don't believe us or not. <laughs> we just say, oh, no, it's like this. 
So that's where we believe. Now there's there's caves that are up north and south of us that's the people like the Coast Yukis and the Cotto believe they come from. Stewart's Point people, they can walk you right to the cave where the first man came right out of. So this is where, uh, this is a very special place. <clears throat> I wanna acknowledge that we're on the land of the Southern Pomo people here in the Coast Miwoks right here in Santa Rosa. The, um, well, this is what I use for Santa Rosa College, but I know we're not on the college, but we're in the Bitacomtara or the Kainomea people, commonly known as Southern Pomo. It can include people from Dry Creek, Lytton, Stewart's Point, Cloverdale, Federated Tribes of Grayton. We must also acknowledge the Coast Miwok and Wapo. And there's even Patwin and Lake Miwok over at Middletown or in this region. Uh, Southern Pomo peoples continue to remain a relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. And they are important parts of not only the history of this place, but also in the continuing knowledge of this place. So storytelling, this is an ancient, ancient tradition. So this is something that takes place between a storyteller like me and an audience, like you. And over time, we can tell how stories have evolved, but those key elements never change. And you try to work very hard at not altering a story to getting the facts straight. Yeah, you can pizzazz it up with your personality like I do all the time, <laughs> but, but you have to remember the key components, what happened, where, who are the players. And then there's all different kinds of stories so each community or tribal group, and remember, there are like 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. So that means 574 separate origin stories too, separate stories of how people became people here in this land. All of those ancient stories, they can go for days because they have to name every single species in the ocean, all the animals in the ocean, those all got named first. They lived here first. And a lot of native people believe that they talked and had personalities. And that's why you see coyote and frog and like all the different ones in, in our stories, like from Hoplin, how we have coyote and frog woman, his wife, which is the, the rock that is known today as Mata Kawokabe but it's commonly known to most people as squaw rock. But because the word squaw is the derogatory term for native women, we're changing that name so that we don't have to be reminded what it really means, which is a really ugly word. <clears throat> so, Mataka Wokabe it is. <laughs> um, also, we have origin stories those are those really old stories you don't know when they were told you just know they're so old they happened a long long time ago myths and folklore i don't like those words although it's a classification i'm trying to come up with different words like that in my own language <laughs> because they sort of suggest that they're not real. And all I can tell you is, no, I'm not gonna tell you some of the really hardcore scary ones that I know. I've had two people run out of class before. Those ones are spooky. Um, those ones are the really tre treasured ones too. Those are rare. Uh, but every, every, the myths and folklore, they suggest that they're, they're not real. And all I can tell you is I, when I tell people, when they say, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe in Bigfoot. Fine, you don't have to. But all I'm telling you is that my friend's dad saw this 65 years ago. I'm not going to tell him that he's full of it. <laughs> uh, instead, I would just say, how do you know you weren't there? You didn't see it. That's a good one, I think. <laughs> 
Anyways, and then there's the supernatural. I know tons of those. Um, those are the really rare ones. Those are the ones that my students go crazy about. They keep begging for more. I can't get them out of Zoom. <clears throat> my one hour office hours can go three hours sometimes with my student. They just won't leave. <laughs> Anyways, there's cultural taboos when you're telling stories. Never interrupt. Don't laugh at people or shake your head or roll your eyes. And these are all basics, right? I, I had to tell this at the last lecture I gave on campus. And one of my students interrupted me while I was telling him the rule is to not interrupt. But sometimes people have disabilities and you overlook those things. And so you just, you know, patiently explain, no, we don't do that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, but I'll have storage. Of, uh, you can ask questions afterward and I, I, I'll stay. Um, also, to give your storyteller suggestions and ideas, um, ways that you can give a storyteller, well, I've already been gifted to come here, but um, is I'm a, um, if you really want to know, one of the ways that I would could suggest for donations at all would be for a club that I'm a um, faculty mentor for. We're awesome. We're called American Indian Science and Engineering Society. We just created a national chapter at Santa Rosa. I managed to scrape up a bunch of Indian students who are engineering majors, math majors, bio majors, people who are gonna be doctors, engineers, and they're going into the STEM field. And so we're trying to get them to Seattle for the regional conference, not the regional, for the nationals. And then um, we hope to host a, uh, a regional region two conference here at Santa Rosa next year. I um, mean, we've got like um, Nicole Mann, the wide lackey astronaut is gonna come and give us a welcome greeting when the STEM building opens up at Santa Rosa in August. It's gonna be amazing. We've got like all sorts of cool projects going on. The students are doing the renaming project of native plants. They're working with the biology department. There's just so many cool stuff we can do. Um, anyways, those are my group of students, and I can tell you more about it if you're interested. So just a little bit of background about California. Okay, so California had close to a million people living here. Largest, most populated indigenous place north of Mexico City. Tons, there's so many they don't even know. They estimate. That's all they can do is guess. So... At the time, though, when missions were established, it was thought to be that there were 310,000 Indians living right here, but we don't know. Um, in 1900, between 1850, so during the brutal years of California, it was a really horrific time. I managed to survive, and I'm standing here today because my six-year-old great-great-grandmother survived the Russian River Massacre right in Auckland. There were 75 killed after Lieutenant Lyon. He went rogue. I was like, what's this guy doing? I was sitting there looking through the archives at the State Library. I was like, he didn't even have any orders. He just went and did it. And 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 he even laughed about it. Um, I, I didn't think it was very funny. But I'm, my grandma survived. Her name was Sarah Knight. Her dad put her on his shoulders and climbed through a slough all the way down to the Russian River. And then he climbed Duncan's Peak, Sea Knoll, and hid there for three weeks. We also had the help of Fernando Felis, who told the soldiers a fib and protected us by saying, Oh, you know how their pomos are. They're superstitious when it comes to bears. There's been bears around here. They're gone. They're not even here. There's no use sticking around looking for them. They're not even here. <laughs> is basically what he told them. And it worked. And it worked. And so my grandma got to live to be able to have my grandfather, John Knight Jr., who had a daughter named Genevieve Knight, who then had a daughter named Shirley <laughs> who had a daughter named me, and now I have a daughter named Sheila. And so all of that happened because of a story about survival. 
So that's what I celebrate. The Bible. <clears throat> so um, I know that there's no more recent um, data. I have to put up the 2020, but there's there were es estimated 720,000 Indians. It's more like 1 million um, now. Anyways, there's 109 federally recognized tribes. Those are the tribes in California. So that's a lot. In um, Alaskan villages have about 250. They're loaded. But California, Oklahoma, the Southwest, that's where you're gonna see your most populous native areas. And then there are even 80 tribes that are petitioning for recognition. And those guys have been waiting for like 30 years. Um, but we do have some tribes like locally here in Sonoma County area who have been restored like Grayton and Lytton and then some of the Tilly tribes like Cloverdale and Kashaya is historic though. They're a historic tribe. They never terminated or anything. But anyway, so we have a, over a hundred rancherias. Rancherias are simply an, uh, another word for um, the homeless Indians when they didn't have anywhere to go. Um, there was legislation where they purchased little small tracks and ranches so that we could have somewhere to live. And they weren't meant for growth or development. <laughs> a lot of it didn't have water, didn't have resources or anything. My dad's res had little 40 acres in Stewart's Point right on the top of a mountain. And that's where he grew up. He said his whole life was spent gathering wood and hauling water. <laughs> and then if you just look at here, see how we're down here in Santa Rosa? And we're down here in, these are all the different uh, regions of Pomo. So we're also, we're in Coast Miwok territory. We're surrounded by Wapo, Coast Miwok, and Pomo. You guys know that Pomo is not a real word, right? Oh, uh, uh, so Krober and his, some of his very first students um, at UC Berkeley came up with that term to classify us. We're the recipients of all these classification systems, right? And POMO actually means, POO means um, it's the magnesite that it's a rock and you take that rock and you heat it and then you bake it and you can make these POO beads. They're like, they look like, they look like, um, it looks like something like you do ceramics and put it in a, uh, and bake it gets real beautiful. Anyway, that's what Po'o is. It's an Indian, it's our currency system. It's the most, it's like, it's like bars of gold versus the clamshell, which would be like dollar bills. That's the equivalency. So it's very valuable. There are only two people in California today who make them. One is my brother, Sean Patty. Um, and he doesn't tell, I don't even know how it's made. And he's gonna decide who he teaches for that, that's something that they, people like him get to decide, very rare. So that's what that means, po'o means Indian gold, and mo or ma is earth or hole. So it's the hole where red earth magnesite is, that's out in Potter Valley. Because there was a village out there called Pomo, Pomo. Tons of magnesite, you find it down on the creek, all those rocks. So that's what that means. Our names that we had for ourselves are different. Like I'm a Boya or I'm a Chanello. Chanello is a roundhouse person from Hopland. That's what we were, roundhouse people, because we had multiple roundhouses. And um, Kashaya, they're called, Kashaya means expert gamblers. <laughs> boya, I'm a Boya. I'm a Padahan. I'm from the mouth of the river or the point of Garcia River. That's Padaha, where that mouth of the river is, where it runs right into the ocean. I'm from right there. I'm a Boya, ocean person. So most tribal uh, identifi identification terms that they use have to deal with the resource or the food or where they actually sit. So it's very interesting. You have 
names of people versus the name of the town versus the name of a temporary campsite. Then you've got your villages, which have your burial grounds and a dance house. That's how you tell the difference between some places with just stopovers, just to like to sleep for the two day trek, which my aunt, who is still alive, my aunt Juanita Antone, she told me, she goes, oh, I hate going to the coast when we were little. She goes, our, our horse and buggy was just so bumpy. She goes, oh, but Aunt Mary's, oh, hers was like riding in a Cadillac, just smooth. <laughs> and so she still remembers that. I have a, one relative who still remembers when Indians didn't bury, when they put them up on the piers and burned them. They didn't start burying. Um, they only started burying when they ran into Americans. They didn't do that before. Yeah. There's really interesting stuff out there. So you can see all the different places and tribes. I see the Boya, that's where I'm from, Point Arena. But I'm also from Kashaya right here. And then my grandma is from Coast Miwok. I don't know, I'm just learning about her. She was from Tamales Bay and her name was Emma Coulter. And that's, I'm finding out more about her. I'm also trying to teach myself Southern Pomo it's very much like central. So I'm trying to learn all the names of the towns in Sonoma because I just moved here. I had to get to use Navigator just to find this place. I, the, the last time I lived in Santa Rosa was 1969 during the earthquake. I was awake. I remember that. 1969, 5.7. It was big. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of places. And then when you look at where we're from, these are the different languages. You've got your Cloverdale, Hills of Santa Rosa. That's where we are right here. We're Southern speakers. Fort Ross, that's Southwestern. That's the, that language is, this is the difference. Point Arena, they say, hi, how are you? See, si, mama. My dad's people from Stewart's Point would say, hey, Enzi, wa me to ni? See? Showing off, I am. <laughs> oh, and northern people would say, Santa Ma. And then my husband's people from southeastern Pomo would say, Hey, Kate Ma. So I'm trying to learn all of them. <laughs> I create curriculum, by the way, for schools too. So <laughs> I found this. Non-native people can tell a story nice and neat and cute and perfect. <sighs> Us natives get carried away and start saying, oh my God, remember that one time? Oh, and, oh, and then remember what? And everything gets all, and I even during my evaluation, one of my tenure members said, Lori, you get so far off track from your stories. I said, but I always find my way back. It drives um, people crazy, especially people who like things nice and linear and nice and neat and straight. Um, but something you just remembered, you could say, oh my God, wait a minute. I got to tell you this one story the first. Things like that. It's sort of a humorous little way just to let you know that it can get off track. So let's start with this one. So there... <laughs> I also administer a Facebook group for the past 15 years. I have almost 6,000 people that I can reach daily. Mata Kabe. This is the one place called Squaw Rock. Used to be. My brother, when he was the chairman, approached the private landowner. And it was a simple, um, they agreed to it. They agreed and said, you know, I like that. We had all the uh, research um, backup. Um, through myself and through um, uh, Ricky Patterson, um, who did her dissertation on Russian River Indians. So we showed um, all the different ways that tribal people throughout the country have been removing that word squaw, which refers to um, a female private parts in the French language. And so up in up on the border of Canada. So we want that word gone. 
So Squaw Valley just changed their name. Um, Squaw Peaks changed their name. And it's just a, something that's happened. Another one, a good one to change, it would be Digger, Digger Creeks, Digger this, Digger. Digger is like a, the N-word for Indians in California during the 1860s. It was a really awful term also. So we don't talk like that anymore. So it's good to change those names so that people, we don't, you know, call native people heathens and devils and things like that. So we don't use those terms either. So, but some people still say it, even I do. Sometimes I'll say, oops, Squaw Rock, oops. I remember. So I don't believe the stories though. I checked into this. And I think it's really a romanticized version of a story where, I mean, it's hard to say. They say that a woman was going to marry a man and he changed his mind and married one else instead from Cloverdale. It was this Poplin Indian guy. And I, I see a name but I can't find any information about them. And I can't for the life of me figure out why no one in my family knows anything about this story. So I, I doubt that it's actually a real story. But what they say is that it's a, a woman who threw herself off the top. Now, they claim that there was a village right at the base of the rock, like right in the river. I don't believe that. I don't believe that she could jump off of there and land on the man and, and his new bride and kill them either. It's impossible. If I mean, I'm no engineer <laughs> by all means, but I could see what's going to happen if you jump off the top of there. Now, on the other side is some scary stories, though, because that's where the little people live in those rocks right across. But I don't believe that. There's so there's all these stories. Everybody had like there was that I, I read 15 different versions by just posting this picture in my group that I minister on Facebook. <laughs> I just don't believe them though. But uh, I don't have a right to tell somebody that. I don't believe that I have a right. Now, if a family wants to like agree to believe this one version, go for it. That doesn't mean I do. That's all. That is all. Oh, but I want to read this one. Now, if you ever want to read a cool book, Abalone Tales by Les Fields, in my class in the fall, I'm teaching a class <clears throat> called Original Californians. And it'll be a, it's one of my brand new courses. So I'm teaching that in the fall. It's going to be all in California culture. It's not just history. A history class is different than a culture class versus contemporary issues and affairs, or that can include like the jewelry makers. And let's, let's get out of just talking about the gold rush. Let's get out of just talking about the terminal narratives there's there's more there's current things i have taken place that we should focus on too so that's how i approach it so les fields he worked with my cousin her name was florence silva she lived to be 95 she was my best friend she was my mom's best friend too and she was half italian she was the one who was supposed to have been the indian doctor but the people hated her so bad because she was a half breed that they rejected her within the reservation. And it was really sad to watch. In fact, women who married non-Indians were lost their citizenship in the tribe until my dad became chairman and he convinced the people to do a constitutional amendment. And he said, hey, so men, when, where did this tradition come from? Where did it originate? Think about it. This isn't even real. So men can marry non-Indians, but when a woman does it, she's not a member anymore. No, that's got to go. Outdated, outmoded, got to go. 
And he convinced the people and they changed it. My dad, I watched him to go through seven constitutional amendments. I was raised at meetings. I knew the bylaws of our tribe when I was like 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Florence, see how I got signed off? I have all her notes. Now what's published in there is nothing compared to the unpublished field notes that he worked with her. Les Fields is awesome. He's a non-Indian researcher. He's one of my favorites beside Peter Nabokov. Parent of all abalone. He has a, uh, there's a really good story in there about abalone woman and dentalia man also. Okay. So Florence Silva, she tells how her grandfather, John Boson's specialty dance was this abalone dance and his abalone pectoral was an essential piece of regalia in the rituals of the Boli Maru religion at Manchester. The parent of all abalone is a story that tells about Florence's father, John Bajoli. He was Italian. He was on the he's on the right hand side. That's Florence's father, John Pajoli, and her mother, um, Annie Boston. Annie's father was John Boston. That's my great great grandfather. He was our spiritual Maru for fifty years. He predicted the end of the world. He predicted the San Francisco earthquake. He predicted the fire. He said lots of things. He even said he stopped an earthquake once. Oh my God, I caused such an uproar on Facebook by posting that when it was just a story about earthquakes. I got attacked by all of these people. And I was like, I'm only telling you what my grandpa said. It was like, God, you don't have to be such haters. What the hell? Haters. Yeah. They was like, oh, that's impossible. I was like, how do you know? You weren't there. That's my grandpa. That's my grandma, though. That's his second wife. My grandma was a, a, Annie's sister, Lizzie. But so her dad, her dad, Florence's dad, found um, a gigantic abalone during a king tide north of the Point Arena Lighthouse. So one of those really big, massive tides. So her father ran all the way home to tell everybody what he had saw. So Silver's grandfather, John Boston, the man on the left-hand side of that photo, um, he, he was very excited and interested by the news. The huge abalone was never seen again. Hopefully it's still there, hoping it stays there. According to Boston, the parent of all abalone was neither female, female or male, but could produce offspring. This abalone was very big and it was the first abalone. Boston also performed rituals, special ones, where he would take care of the abalone and he can make them spawn by tapping them with a special stick. Like that. That's how they do up in uh, Coast Yuki territory. When you go out there and go clean and go pick seaweed, those old people will go out there and go, Hup! and just scream real loud though. I won't do it in the microphone. I'll hurt you guys' ears, but they'll just do a, Hup! and they do that so that those, mythical creatures that are in that ocean don't bother them because my friends have told me how their grandparents have seen horses and cows with gills up there by you saw walking on the beach and all those special creatures the little blue people um all sorts i've got like i said i've got a million stories <laughs> okay so he tapped the stick, tapped the abalone, it can make him spawn. First abalone was the first creature to live in the sea. If the first abalone ever died, that would mean all the abalones have died, all of the creatures, and it would be like the end of the world. Now, what he said was, 
that there isn't going to be an end of the world where everyone just dies. He says that what's going to happen is there was going to be a big flood. And he said that the flood would probably take people all the way into like I-5. So he said um, there would be survivors, but the people who survived are going to suffer because there's going to be a food shortage and the people who survive will be will kill you for the apple sitting on your table is what he said. When winters become summer, when summers become winter, when species grow out of season, when albino species suddenly appear, when things don't grow or grow out of season. And I think that he was talking about climate change. <clears throat> I'm not sure though. I don't know, but that's what he's describing to me. And that's where it is, somewhere out there. This is north of the lighthouse. I love it. It's my favorite place to be ever. Driving the elk over the cliff. Ooh, I found this one digging through the archives in Berkeley. These stories had been just sitting there for 70 years in drawers until my nosy little self came along. <laughs> Okay, the Indians of Boya tribe used to live at Malala. From there, they hunted elk. All the land around Point Arena was covered with timber. Everything was wild. The Indians picked out the young men to chase the elk. While they were chasing the elk, the men who ran to the sides had bows and arrows. The men who ran behind the elk had sticks, which they would hit the brush to scare the elk so they would run back. There used to be this large hole on the north side of the Point Arena Lighthouse. So American people call it Devil's Punch Bowl. My people call it Cabemo, Hole and Rock. And it was a big pit. That's how it used to look. This is what it looks like now. You see where the, the green is, that circle? That's, it's eroding. It's eroding even more because the land used to go way out there. But so they used to run the elk, run them right into that pit. Then they'd have to go down there and um, use rope, make their own rope and pull them up. And he said it was hard. <laughs> but anyway... So they, so they, um, oh, sorry. So this whole peninsula area was covered in brush. And so that's what they did. They would chase that elk right into those pits. Sometimes they would start running and, and no one could stop them. They made lots of noise. And then when they got to the hole, they would make it, they would scream. <laughs> and then the elk would jump into the hole Anyway, it was difficult to bring those elk up. So the Point Arena Peninsula, it's uh, present is barren of vegetation. The hole into the which the elk were stampeded, stampeded is still there. It's about 30 feet deep. Um, it's a rough circle, about 60 feet in diameter, commonly known as Devil's Cauldron, Devil's Punch Bowl, or Cabe Bowl. Oh, this is a good one. This is the bear at Sea Line Rock. Have you guys ever been out to the Stornetta Public Lands? Well, there's an island out there. It's called Sea Line Rock. Kapadakagabe, Water Bear Rock. It's our most famous place that we gather food. Now, this is my cousin. Her nickname is Bear. <laughs> She's Wapo, Homo. Oh, all, all kinds of tribes. That's her son. Her great-grandfather is the man telling the story in 1926 that I'm going to read to you. So I just I thought it was cool that his descendants are walking 
right where he's talking about and that her nickname is Bear. <laughs> okay. Ooh, a bear at Ceylon Rock. This is another story about Chief Chaboos. One day he was at the ocean looking around. He was at Sea Line Rock. While he was there, a bear smelled his tracks and followed him. Soon the old man found out and ran towards the bluff. The bear got close to him. The bear stood up to bite him. Chaboos grabbed the bear's ears and spit in the bear's eyes so he couldn't see him. The bear scratched his arms up, but he was a strong man. He made that bear back up. With all his might, he pushed the bear over the ocean bluff. Then he ran away. He crawled under a thick brush where it was hard for a man to get in. Soon the bear was coming after him. The bear was around and on top of him, but couldn't get to him. The brush was just too thick. The bear got tired looking for him, and he finally went away. After the bear went away, old man Chaboos ran away. He ran down to the ocean and went home that way. The whole tribe was staying at Malala. This old man Chaboos, he used to pack 20 salmon when he was young. He'd take them home without taking a rest. He used to crack the ocean snails with his teeth. He was one of the strongest men of the Boya tribe. When he would find out that another tribe's warriors or outside people or night men were coming in to fight and attack him, he would sit out all by himself and watch for them to come all by himself. Sometimes they wouldn't even come near the house. He was a, I'm, I can't figure out who Chaboos is. I'm still on a mission to find out who that man was in our history, but I've heard he's all full of bites from those sea lions biting him when he used to go hunting out here. So that's one story that was told 1935 by Stephen Parrish, my cousin Carrie's great grandfather. Ooh, my favorite. This is a really important story. It's called Thunder's House Under the Sea. A brother and his sister lived in the same village. The brother had one son. The sister had no children. Her husband had a dam and caught all the fish they wanted. Her brother went out hunting and tried to get food for his little boy. The little boy went to his aunt to beg for fish, but his aunt refused to give him any. This made the little boy and his mother cry. Finally, after they had been doing this way for four days, that man found out what was the matter. Because when he came home, he found his wife crying. And he asked her, what was the matter? She told him, I'm crying about my baby. He tried to get fish to eat and your sister will not give any to him. This made me feel bad. I've been crying for four days. Next morning, the man went to his sister's house. Her husband came out with a lot of fish and she cooked some in the ashes. Her brother stayed for a long time, but they did not take the fish out. After he stayed nearly half a day, he became angry and he asked, when are you going to take that fish out of the fire? Then he stood up and stepped on the fish where they had been buried in the ashes. After this, he went to his house and he took down his dance paraphernalia and his beads, his clamshells, his feathers. And he went out and dressed up in his dance outfit, taking with him his bow and arrows. He told his wife he was going away because his sister would not give fish either to himself or his child. So he went off toward the east. He went on till he came to the ridge north of Brush Creek. He stopped on this ridge at the site of the old village of Kotalau. He rested there for a little bit, and then when he went down across Brush Creek, past the old village of Padaha, from there he went westward, passing along the sides of the big lagoon just west of the town of Manchester to a small lagoon west of this. 
near the shore of the ocean, right by Stornetta's, Stornetta's ranch. <clears throat> he stood there for quite a while. His sister, his wife, and son came crying and begged him to stay, but he walked right out into the water. He walked on and on all the time, getting shorter to those on the shore until only the tops of his feathers of his plume sticks, the katas, the men wear these sticks. Lake County Indians wear them out the back. There's three of them on each side. They wear them sideways. Coast people, we're deer people. We wear them straight up. They're bird people. We're deer people. So their horns are called katas. And that man walked into the water and just came, became shorter and shorter until they couldn't see the sticks anymore. This place where he went out of sight is the point farthest north of the Point Arena Lighthouse, where you can see breakers and white foam all the time. Saunders Reef is what they call it. Before he went out there, there were never any breakers at this place and no white foam. It was always smooth before that. Whenever you hear thunder, it always starts from this place. And some people think that thunder was the man who went down there. This man has a big house at this point. It's made of a sort of a glass-like substance. You can see right through the side of his house. You can and see everything that is going on inside. There are many fish in here and they jump out and strike the walls trying to get out. The inside of the house is perfectly dry despite being submerged in the ocean. The Garcia River flows directly to this house and he is the one who sends the fish up the river. He has a big lever as large as a redwood tree. Which is, which when he pulls it down only a little, lets millions of salmon out so they can run right up the river. They always run directly up the Garcia River because the river flows right to them. Inside the house, Thunder has something which acts as some sort of a kind of reflector and shows him what the whole world is doing. It shows him all the people and he can see what everyone is doing all over the world, what everyone is doing everywhere. Nobody knows just what he eats, but he lives there all alone. Whenever he moves any part of his body, even when he rolls over, it makes a great noise. Under his left arm, he keeps a square piece of glass-like material and makes the lightning if he were to hold this out for a long time, everybody would go blind and the world would burn up. On the plate supporting the rafters over his door, he keeps four split stick rattles. These he just keeps here, but nobody knows what he uses them for. No one dares goes out to this place where Thunder lives, not even a shaman. Ooh. The story was told January 8th, 1907 by Billy James. Billy James' son is Harvey, right on the left with his wife, Nan Whipple. He's buried in the Laytonville Tribal Cemetery. Billy James' father is Captain Charlie, right here on the right. He was married to an Indian woman from Kings County. She was Yokut. This is, these people are my daughter's ancestors. That's her great, 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 great grandfather sitting down. He was 120 something years old. You know that my grandparents lived to be 123, 127, 109, 117. 
They lived to be old back in the day. They ate good, healthy foods. They had little doorways this big to get in and zip in and out of. <laughs> they were healthy people. We're trying to get back there again by eating traditional foods. I'm doing it too. I want to live like that. <laughs> but yeah, Billy James told this story. Billy James descendants lived right here in Santa Rosa. It's a big family. It's called Cobarubias and the Ilars. They, they married Filipino, and that's their name. But they, but that they're all come from him. And this, that was his story. That place, that place where Thunder lives. I'm gonna try to commission Eric Wilder to draw me a version of what he sees in his mind as an artist. I would like to see that to go with my story someday. I'm gonna get there. <laughs> oh, here's a cute one. On the left is my Aunt Juanita Antone. In the middle is my mother. That's my mom. Her name was Shirley, Shirley Smith. And on the right is my great grandma, Isabel, Isabel Knight, Isabel Joaquin Knight. She was 15 years old in that photo. This story is just a little cute one. It's called Mean What Denim. So my aunt told me this story, the lady on the left. She said that when her mother died, Isabel on the right, that my mom was very close to her. And she said, did you know that your mom spoke Indian, Spanish and English as a little girl? And I said, no, I didn't know that. So she goes, yeah, she goes, when my mom died, she was surely was real close to her and she was just sad. And so we went to the funeral and buried her we came home and she said, all of us kids were all asleep in one, one bed, one room house. She said that we were like little sardines on the floor <laughs> is how she described it. And how the newspaper filled up the holes in the walls to cover the wind from getting in. I remember her telling me that. And anyway, Aunt Winnie said, she goes, yeah, so we were all laying there asleep and Shirley was crying, my mom. And she said, my mom was crying hard and going, <laughs> you know, like a little kid's crying and having a hard time breathing. Uh, like if you're really crying hard to grief. She said, my mom was crying hard and all of a sudden they can hear creaking on the floor. And she said, a big cold breeze came right through the cabin. And she said, I heard my mother's voice. I heard my mom tell Shirley, mean what, Denim? And I go, what's that mean? She said, it means don't cry. And she said, my mom went, <gasps> I fell asleep. Oh, that made me cry. My mom's been gone <laughs> almost 20 years. And I still, when I talk about her, makes my eyes water. I miss her so much. But that's it. Mean what then? Don't cry. Don't cry, Lori. Oh, I thought I already showed you that one. That's the lagoon he walked in. That's why Thunderman walked right in. See? Those rocks, those rocks that we have right under there, they're uh those they got some crazy stories to them too. But that's where that man walked away. Are we getting close? Okay. I think I'm done. Yeah, that's it. Perfect timing. <laughs> Woo! Yahweh, thank you. Thank you for our wonderful presentation. We have a few <laughs> moments um, for some question and answer. If you would like yeah. to ask any questions, we're here ready for you. Yeah, any I'm, questions? 
I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm ha I love questions. Going back to your map of the various tribes in California, there was a wide swath around San Bernardino County, around the coast, where there weren't any tribes shown at all. Oh, yeah. That's uh, because of the mission system. That's because of the mission system in California. Okay. So that's why if, if I were to show a map of fairly recognized tribes, you'll see nothing beyond Mississippi because of the 1830 Indian removal policy. So that's why all they're all every they, everybody was removed and put into Oklahoma, which was Indian territory before it became the state of Oklahoma. So on the south in the Southern California, there's hardly any tribes along that coast. That's where the mission system ended right here in Sonoma. And a little bit they came into Hopland, Mendocino County, but that's why Santa Rosa got hit pretty hard first, too. That's why there's no tribes. There's still people, though, descendants of those people. <laughs> Question? Wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm just uh, wondering oh. about the relationships between the tribes. Um, they could understand each other's languages, uh, they they mutually understand each other's languages were they dialects of one another or or different languages they're actually separate languages but they were misclassified as dialects within the central pomo dialect there are four subgroups i come from all four yorkville hopland ukiah point arena point arena and hopland can understand each other almost exactly the same me my grandma and grandfather's tribe, they're like, it's completely different. My husband, oh my God, I'm scared of them. When when my husband talks to me, I'm like, ah. <laughs> That's all I can say. And speaking of yeah. your husband, I was thinking that the language may follow uh, marriage relationships and things like that. Oh, yeah. Were there certain groups that did marry with each other and didn't? I mean, I'm just interested. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know who was our enemy was Fort Bragg. Oh, Bull Dam. Yeah, one of our women went missing up there. It was considered foul play, and it was blood law, an eye for an eye. You lost one of ours. You pick who dies next. Who's it going to be? You pick. That's what happened when one of our women went missing a long time ago. This was pre-contact days. People spoke multiple dialects. I met a woman who spoke all seven around Clear Lake. I, I just this learned that when I was working at Mendocino College, when I lectured yesterday over there in Lakeport, that the three women that I interviewed, what was it? Beverly John, Mildred Goforth, and Jeanette Holder, they're all passed away now. They were the last speakers of their language. And so I said, I want to give these recordings to your fam your tribe and to the family members, because sometimes those relationships are tricky. <laughs> you have political feuds. So I want them to have them, because I don't want them just to be sitting on my hard drives or on these or on my bookshelves. So I'm trying to figure out to make, I said, oh, great. Then I'm going to make a little Pomo language center, native language center of just resources of online and then put students to work with part-time jobs. I've got this envision already figured out for the college. I'm going to make it happen. I'll find the money for it. You watch. <laughs> but yeah, we spoke multiple dialects. My dad spoke three um, my husband speaks a couple. It was common. It was common to speak tons of dialects. Yeah. They're all different, like, like ma e and ma te or man de. Can they? That's mother and father. That's just in my mom and dad's dialects. There's more. 
they usually, they're kind of similar, but there are theories about that. There are linguistic theories that, that suggest that the original people were created right there at Clear Lake. And then there's some people who say, no, mm -mm, Potter Valley. Both places were super intense and filled with lots of food and resources to make that happen. I just don't know. And I don't think I'll probably ever know. They're just theories. We're trying to figure out, you know, what happened. <laughs> but thank you. Good question. What a great, what a great talk. Um, when the Russians left Fort Ross, they took their wives, who were in fact members of the Native Americans. Did they retain their language and uh, culture at all in Russia? I don't know. I don't know, but you know who would know is the Kashaya Indian tribe because they recently took a couple trips there. Um, I know that some of my relatives have traveled over there because they took baskets, they took women. Um, I'm sure I have a bunch of relatives in Russia. Um, I, I know that one another interesting tidbit is that that's the only treaty honored in California because the 18 treaties got, were unratified when gold was discovered and they were thrown in a drawer and locked under secrecy for 55 years. That's how the Indians in California were considered homeless and legislation was created to purchase little pieces of ranches and property that became what is known today as rancherias. They're the same things as reservations. It's just that they bought small ranches. Like we bought the, what was it? We bought a, a, a oh, the old Iverson Ranch. That's where, that was part of the New Deal. That was part of the New Deal process. Oh my God, I could go for days, you guys. I teach history, I teach policies and law. I teach culture, I teach all sorts of stuff, everything. <laughs> well, we would love to have you back at some point to oh, expand yeah. on this. Oh. I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the Sunday Symposium. Yeah. Um, next week, remember we have the California Parks. Thank you. So please come in, and Laura, you're going to be here for a little while, and we'll be uh, able to yeah, address any of your individual questions. Thanks yeah. so much. You can ask me more questions if you want. <laughs>